I grew up in Los Angeles. When we moved to DC, it was like we just met this guy, Danny Ingram, who was in later in this band called Youth Brigade. And then he was like, oh yeah, you should meet my friend, Alec. Mackay, so I met Alec, and then Alec's like, you should meet my brother Ian, and Ian and I just became friends. And at that point, I guess Teen Idols just broke up and Minor Threat had just formed. My mom rented this house that was this old Victorian house, and it had a basement, and it was a separated, like its own block. So no, none of the bands had anywhere to practice, so they all practiced that summer in the basement of this house in the summer of 81 in DC, which was really fun, because I just like would hang out on the porch and drink tea and like watch TV and bands would come over and practice. I mean, it was like really great. My mom let us do all that stuff. Everybody was on the same level, like 80, 81, whatever, girls and boys, men or women, whatever, because it was all, we were all really young. Like it was a really small scene, you know, in 82, it got a lot larger, became what they called hardcore because somewhere in 81, somebody came up with that term. I'm not sure who. I kind of feel like Jeff Nelson did, but I'm not totally sure. I mean, I was totally uninterested in like the violent part of it. It was fun when it was like, it wasn't slam dancing, but it was like being goofy with your friends dancing. And then it became like violent. All of a sudden there was momentum about something happening. I mean, it was a really amazing experience to have, feel it happen. And all of a sudden it wasn't yours anymore and your friends, it was like thrown out there and everybody was involved. In 85, that was where I realized, I was like, I gotta do this book on the DC punk scene because I, what happened in those years in the early 80s, I thought were really phenomenal. And I just felt like, it needed to be somehow documented. Really, I just wanted the book for myself so I could just look at it. Like, that was my goal. It's like, it would be really cool to have a book and it wouldn't be a zine. The only people who took photos, actually, in the early days were mostly w women, and it became that way. There was a greater separation with the sort of violence because you wanted to be involved with it some way. It became like women were doing like the photography, like organizing stuff, making flyers, and the guys were like in the bands. <laughs> and I feel like when some people, like women were in bands, there was like this weird, like, wait a minute, like all of a sudden kind of thing because it was not of the norm, you know, which of course always irritated me because I was like, whatever, we're just doing what we want to do and it doesn't matter who's doing what. There are only women who worked on the book and I actually kind of wanted it that way. When we put it together, we purposely made women like bigger because we wanted to show that there were women in the scene and they were doing things, even though they weren't always in front of the camera. And I felt like that was how I voiced my opinion and things, you know? Kids get kicked off their shirts when they get hot, and if we see any guys with a heart on, we get kicked in the balls. I was going to music school, and I was in a music, I think it was a ear training class, and the girl in front of me turned around and she goes, you play drums, don't you? And I said, yeah, and she goes, you want to play with my band? And uh, basically I dropped out of music school and started playing punk rock. Punk rock is a way to be free and to say who you are and express what you want to express, and so they took it to sexuality, being open with your sexuality, not being afraid to show it to other people and saying, hey, you know, and finding a way to do it in a performance way. I would say for the most part I think it's perceived pretty well. I think when men come to first check us out, if they already know we're a political band, we're already, they already know there's, you know, gender issues and sexual issues, they'll come kind of defensively. You know, they'll be like, you know, you hate us, you're trying to cut our dicks off, you're horrible, and then they come and see what we're really doing on stage and they start to have fun and then they get it, you know, it's a bit it's not all tongue-in-cheek, but there's a bit of tongue-in-cheek and there's also a bit of things that maybe they need to hear. If they really make it through and listen to us and get to know who we are, it's been really positive. And then there, there's a whole group of guys that just come to see rock shows and they don't, they just out to have a good time. So they're just like, yeah, great, you know, girls playing music. And then half the time they don't know we're girls, so it gets very confusing right there. So. I moved to the Bay Area in 1989 to go to school at Mills. There were um, really great bands playing at the time. It was like Crimp Shrine and Operation Ivy and Frightwig um, and Mud Women. It was, it was amazing. I immediately sort of got involved with booking bands at Gilman Street. This guy, Jesse uh, Luscious, Jesse Townley, was also booking there. And we had sort of a combative friendship. And he was in this new band, Blatz. And at one point he said that they wanted female vocalist and he wanted me to come try out. There were actual tryouts for the girl. What he didn't know was that I think Eggplant or Joey um, had said that they wanted this other person to come 
and her name's Annie. Now what they really didn't know is that Annie and I were really close. So we came in together and we're like, oh, hi, hi. And then um, we both like uh, tried to do something. I had no idea, I hadn't you know, really sung in, I mean, I'd done a little something in Merced, but I didn't know what I was doing at all. I just slammed a bunch of beer because I was so fucking nervous um, and went in there and was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, you know, and, um, and saw Annie. So Annie and I did our thing and then they were gonna make a decision and Annie and I had just said like, well, neither of us are leaving. So we just made, our, made them take us and we just made ourselves be in the band. We were just like, well, we're coming to rehearsal, sorry. So we took over, kind of. One of the famous things about Blatz, Blatz would always end up getting Jesse naked. Jesse would get pulled into the crowd and all these boys would pile all over him and take off his clothes. So there was like this intense, sort of obvious homoeroticism happening. Like, but everyone was having a really good time. It was like wrestling as homoerotic, you know? Um, and then nobody would touch Annie or me. So there was that weird, like, you're the girl, so you're pedestalized, so you can't be touched thing. And in one hand, it was great because guys weren't grabbing our tits. On the other hand, it was this other sort of like reverse thing where nobody felt, everyone felt like we were too pristine to get near. It was very fun for me to have the stage. In punk there was always this thing, or in my, in my punk, there are punks, right? But in my punk there was always this thing that like, everyone on the stage is the same as everyone in the audience and we're all just here together making... But I knew that there was a power dynamic in being on the stage because I got treated differently after I was on the stage, so I understood that. And I liked using the stage to call out people who were doing fucked up things in the crowd. Because you could really use the stage as a place to educate both people in the audience and also completely school the asshole who just did something. So I would often, if some guy was doing something fucked up, pull him up and have like a little interview with him on the stage and then like either get him kicked out or he would just be humiliated or whatever. So that was fun to me. I think I would probably, no, I wouldn't handle that and lead differently now. I'd probably do the same thing. So that was fun. Madison, Wisconsin in 1990, I met a guitar player, his name is Phil. He always heard me screaming at these protests and thought, you know, you'd be a good punk singer. We should start a punk band and just write protest songs. But uh, he's like, just sing like you're pissed off at the protest, like you're yelling. And that's how the whole thing started. In 1998, we all quit our day jobs because we were going to go on tour for nine months out of the year. And But then um, Phil, uh, died on, on the first tour from an asthma attack, like before the that the first day of the tour, before he even played the show at um, in Fresno at our drummer's parents' house. I disbanded the band for about five years after that, just going through horrible post-traumatic stress and grieving and lots of counseling, trying to figure out how I'm gonna pay the bills and what am I gonna do without. A, you know, Phil, who I became an adult with, and you know, um, really close and probably super codependent to you. We were just, and really just madly in love, and without him it was like a nightmare trying to find out who I was as an adult. Before you know it, all of a sudden the war started again, and I wanted to do, I was just really pissed off, and so I decided I wanted to be naked again, and, like, just to protest the war and keep that memory going, like in Phil's name. I got into punk when I was about 12 years old because of my cousin. He was listening to uh, UK bands like UK Subs, Subhumans, Conflict. And uh, I was really drive by the energy of the music and the lyrics came a bit after because I wasn't that bilingual at the time. I moved to New York City when I was like 17 and that's when I got introduced to the DIY punk scene uh, with ABC No Rio, the, the venue in New York City. I thought it was really inspiring and being a woman in the punk scene in New York, it was uh, it was kind of difficult at, at first, but uh, people were really uh, really welcoming, and uh, I got accepted pretty much right away. Uh, so I started a band there. Here we're talking about like '93, '94. After that, uh, I had to move back to Montreal. When I moved to Europe, like I thought that it was really well organized. The scene was <clears throat> way more organized than in Montreal, mostly because 
all the squats and the, like the opportunity that the punks have there. I had a band in uh, Europe called PCP, uh, People from Season Lives. We toured um, Europe with State of Fear. It was uh, it was a very very good uh, experience for me. It was my first tour. Th that was really really inspiring for me. And when I came back from uh, from Europe, uh, I decided to start a venue that was called Lix. I'm doing Catacombs right now, which is another venue for 18 and plus. It's a co-op. We had to write a business plan. Um, because we needed financing, obviously. None of us uh, has any money. That took us like around two years. We opened the catacombs in November 2006. The whole philosophy is to like provide cheaper services to the, the punk scene, to the artists and groups and promoters, because most of us don't have a lot of resources. So that's the main the main goal of the co-op. We have microbrewed beer only from like reg regional, local, uh, companies, so we try to support the local economy before supporting, obviously multinationals and like Labatt and and Molson and, and Budweiser. We have a bit of money coming out of the bar, like tips and, and stuff like that. But uh, that's pretty much it. Like, we do it basically mainly for the scene. Uh, f for sure, like we hope that we can live off that one day. That's kind of one of the main goals of running a, a venue too. But uh, besides like helping the punk scene and supporting the, the, the artists and groups, so we hope we can achieve that maybe in the next uh, within the next two years. But uh, we'll see. My mom is a pretty non-traditional woman. She works in the theater. She's like a stagehand, and she, you know, raised me to be able to do whatever I want. And the early 90s was amazing. Like I was involved in ABC No Rio from like the very beginning of shows and stuff there. And that was an absolutely amazing experience. It's like one of those times, you know, the right time in the right place. And I mean, uh, I wouldn't change anything about my experience because it was, you know, it was amazing. I started doing the zine when I was 15. And so I've been doing it forever. And it's always been there, you know, it's like always been a part of me. It started out as like, I don't know, like 20 some pages, like just stapled in the corner eight and a half by 11. I lost my Xerox hookup. So I decided I wanted to keep doing it. So I just said, well, let me concentrate on the things I think are the most important, which were at the time, like the classifieds for pen pals and communication contacts, all that kind of the networking focus and then reviews and, um, and photos. And then that's kind of like where the format that it still is today started. A couple issues that were just one page, then it went to 11 by 17, one page. Then I did the newsprint size, you know, tabloid newsprint size, just like one piece, which was four pages. And then it was eight and 12, 16. And then, you know, and likewise, when I started the newsprint, a thousand copies was the minimum. So then it went up in increments of a thousand copies to 10,000. 20 pages, which is currently what it is. All the photos are mine, that's my thing. Like that's photography is my, my, my passion, my hobby, my love. You know, like I went to school for photography. The formula is basically that the advertising pays for the printing and sending a copy um, to everyone that has a review in it, zines and music, and getting them, you know, out there to be distributed into, you know, places that, that want and need them and then people can order subscriptions, individual copies, or um, a stack of however many that they want, and, and that's basically how it gets out there. So it's free, but pay for postage. It's self-sustaining, it doesn't make any, any, any money, it's not a, a job in that sense, and it would never work that way if I, if I wanted it to be, it just, it would never work. For years, um, I would, because my name's, I go by Chris, so, in the mail, you know, as a zine, not, um, you know, people not seeing me in person, everyone just assumes I'm a guy. And that drove me crazy because I, I'm not a dude. And like, why do you assume I'm a dude? You know, like, why is that the assumption that, oh, it's, just, you know, something's being done, it's a zine, whatever, it must be a guy. And I'm just like, no. So I actually ended up changing, I didn't change my name, but I started going by Christine in, in relationship to the zine just to, just, kind of to make an announcement and say, I'm a girl <laughs> and I want you to know it. And not because I think that I should be treated differently and not that 
I am treated differently. But if anything, just to, just to like, just to stand up and say like, come on, you know, give me some recognition for what I do. And I think it's important. It's like, yes, I'm a girl, damn it. Acknowledge it, respect it, and then don't treat me any different. When I was 12 in the early 80s, somebody invited me to a show and it was just chaos and there was no rules, nothing. And it was pretty exciting for a young person and seeing the circle jerks at a real young age and just feeling the energy of the shows and just kept going, kept getting more involved and being more and more excited about seeing bands and and that's how it started for me. There's been a tremendous amount of acceptance even from when I was really young and growing up and just having people take me along with them or sh share music, share what's going on with them. People have come back to the merch table and been like, oh, I only have the split with Drop Dead and had no idea that you're a woman and, and coming up and being like, and just wanting to connect and wanting to talk and being excited that there's a woman on stage for a band that they li had liked previously, um, just to feel more connected. Well, I think that there are more women involved, more women feeling like they're capable and part of the scene in a, a backbone way instead of um, just as part of the audience. But I think that's what holds women back in general is not necessarily having good role models consistently in their town, in their scene of strong women that aren't just out to prove like, I'm a woman and I can do this, but I can do this. I'm a person and I'm a person who connect with other people in the scene and I can make a difference and not just because, oh, I'm the woman or I'm some separate entity is that I'm a person and I have an identity and I have a lot to give to this community. My friend Steve brought over Bad Religion. Seriously, that the first three notes changed my life. I kind of found what I'd been looking for. And then, you know, hanging out with them and reading skate magazines, I started ordering records from like Epitaph and I ordered a Gorilla Biscuits record from Revelation and from there, it, <laughs> it spiraled out of control and I started going to a lot of shows and then I moved up to Baltimore. I started doing shows and I then I just started doing bands and all that kind of came later in life for me. Mostly I love doing bands more than anything in the world and I, I love the scene more than anything else so. <laughs> it's kind of a catch-22 because I really do love being a woman and I love it when women come out and they're like oh my God, you know, this is so awesome. Thank you for doing this, you know, it's, it's awesome. But I also love it when dudes do that too. But I do hate it when people are like, man, I don't think girls can, you know, pull off hardcore, but you pulled off hardcore, you know, singing really well then. And I'm just like, um, what? you know, I'm supposed to take this as a compliment. I started singing in, in Whorehouse Representatives when I was 19. I've been kind of just singing in different bands and, and I'm a feminist, like a, like an equality feminist. I don't believe anybody's better than anybody else, you know. And so sometimes when some, you know, ex extremists, like regardless if it's male or female, it kind of gets on my nerves a little bit when they just are like, I'm woman, rah, you know, and like you can't be here because you're a guy or something like that. Like, but I'm definitely down with like being a woman and like letting people know that I'm here and making my stand and making my mark on it. I'm so stoked on the experience that I've had with these ladies so far. Um, they're really, they're, they're, they're all just kick-ass ladies and they all each have something different to contribute to the band. Our practices go a little bit longer but we're not have practicing half the time because we just sit around and like, it's a really good release where we get to hang out and just like have girl time and you know gossip and just be girls and stupid and giggly and stuff and it's just it's great and you can't really get that with guys i mean you can but i mean it's just you know there's there's just different i have lived in portland since august of 1994. i had originally gotten involved with punk rock stuff through listening to the radio and kind of it being this 
way to fight isolation of a small community or and get more ideas and more exposure to the outside world and get really excited about energy and people who are just as angry as you were. The things about radio and about Maximum that I really appreciate is that they're both a format to be like, you can do whatever you want and it's up to you to figure out what you want and then to actually do it. So it's not that it's easy and it's not that it's glamorous, but you can do what you want. Well, I started getting into punk in Portland because that's where I was born and raised. And mm, at the time when I started, when I was 16, when I, when I started meeting like the people that were in the bands that I've been listening to uh, locally, like there really weren't a lot of, hardly any girls that were actually into punk. There was a lot of girls, and that's not a disservice to them, whatever, you know. They just were around more as girlfriends or to party, which is kind of everywhere. There's a lot of girls like that. So I didn't really have a lot of female influence in the punk scene. I just, But I didn't really care either, because that's I didn't get into it to hang out with other girls. I got into it because I liked the energy. Detestation was my first band that I did, and I didn't write a lot of the lyrics. Like we had so many songs, like a lot of our songs got written in the studio and it was like, oh God, what am I gonna do? And like somebody else would have lyrics, typically Kelly. And I don't like to write overtly like political -ish, like songs. Not what people consider political. Sometimes I look back on lyrics for detestation and I'm a little bit, I, I cringe a little bit because you know I was 18 and I was really idealistic so it felt more real then, you know, as the years have gone by and I've just met so many people in all these different bands that, you know, some of them do actually follow along with what they say, but for the most part, they don't. And that, that was really, you know, disheartening for me. I like to be real, you know. The lyrics for my new band are, I feel that they're charged with more like an awareness than a politic. I feel like that's something that more people should be doing. I, I knew, we all knew, that Thulsa Doom was a great band. And Distraught booked the, the Stratford Mercenary show at Coney Island High, and Simon asked us to play because he had confidence that we were a great band. You know, it was our first show, and it was awesome that he was willing to help us out. The thing that got me the most disappointed, made me the most disappointed in, in our scene, in our community, was the shit talking that we got, maybe not from rival bands, but other bands who've been, you know, seniority, you know, who thought they deserved, they deserved to play the Stratford Mercenaries because they've been in the punk rock scene and they've been New York band forever. And then they're like, oh, well, Leora got it because, you know, little, little sucky sucky. And, I, you know, that, that hurts. That has nothing to do with it. You know, like, oh, okay, so I'm Jorge's girlfriend. I guess special treatment, that's BS. You know, and I think after we played that show and then we would get repeated shows, Across the board, people kept coming out. I, our last show we played at um, Sea Squat, and I was about eight months pregnant, and there was at least 400 people that turned out to see us out as a band, and not because I asked everybody's D's to come to that show, it's because we rocked. wanted to play music in a band situation since I was probably 15 and I got my first guitar when I was 16 and the first song I learned how to play was Iron Man by Black Sabbath. I started playing with Phillips um, just on the side because I didn't have a band. You know we were hanging out and he said you know damn it's breaking up do you want to start a band together? I said yes. So um, we started Kailasa together. We played with punks, two punks. We've played with metal bands, two metal heads. We've played with like, I guess what would be called like stoner rock bands um, to more of like that kind of crowd and then to like indie rock kids too. It seems like there are more women involved in the punk scene. And I, I think that's great and I encourage it. And I've, I see a lot of 
women at our shows, there are less women involved in the metal scene. There are more now than there were. Um, there are even less women involved in like the heavy music scene, which has cropped up in the past few years. It's very rewarding for me personally when some, when a younger girl comes up to me and, and says either, you know, you're a big influence on me, um, you made me want to start playing guitar, you know, I have a band or I'm doing this, or a girl coming up to me who's never seen us. And she's, you know, her and some of her friends will come up and just be just so stoked that they see a girl singing and playing guitar in like a metal band or whatever. And that's super rewarding. Just becoming a teenager and stuff and all the dudes always play music <laughs> and uh, it was kind of odd when a girl plays guitar and stuff. And I would say I have a feminist perspective in lots of ways, although I'm really about equality and solidarity with men too. I love men. <laughs> For me, a lot of the people that have given me most support in my life have also been people who are male. A lot of the men that I'm really close to have also in their lives risked a lot to challenge the kind of mainstream gender definitions that they see and just realizing that, you know, they go through struggles too. I started playing cello in fifth grade and um, I come from a very musical family. Both of my grandparents were music teachers. My dad's a piano tuner. So I think it was always like, what, well, what instrument are you going to play, not are you going to play an instrument? There's been a few shows when I was just so uncomfortable because some guy would be in front of me all drunk and drooling. And, and it's just really uncomfortable to play in that situation when you feel like you're put on display as someone's sex object and um, they're not listening to the music you're creating but so much is just gawking at you. Me and Lisa and some people from Profane and other people from uh, different groups in Minneapolis all did uh, the clit fests in Minneapolis and I think that arose just out of a general want for more active participation of women in punk rock to try and spawn some education and awareness of different issues and things that we had seen in our community and just to also have a good time get people from all over the country to show up and um, bring their music and bring their ideas and activities as well. I was really excited when I heard that other places wanted to have the festival and a little surprised because I think once the fest actually happened too people were surprised that it went over so well and when at first I think we were getting a lot of, are you sure you guys want to do this? Like, you know, is this a good idea? Like, aren't you being, aren't you excluding men or, you know, kind of, I, I got a lot of questioning from people, but then once it actually happened, I think people got really supportive. I grew up in a small town in Tennessee, very conservative environment conservative parents. There wasn't a lot of alternative culture, a lot of alternative ideas around me. I remember the very first time singing through a microphone, just how scary but exhilarating it felt. Just being able to express myself in a way I hadn't before, especially coming from this background of very re repressive environment, I felt like, where you know speaking out definitely wasn't encouraged. So, you know, being on stage, having a microphone, just being able to let loose was just a, an amazing feeling for me. The favorite thing I ever did in Boston was help get Laura Volta going. And this came about after the Prophets were invited to play the first Clip Fest. Being part of Clip Fest was really wonderful. And then in the van, on the way, driving from Minneapolis on the way back to Boston, I had the idea, let's do this in Boston. Let's have our own festival. It'll be wonderful. It'll be great. I started working at CCTV, which is Cambridge Community Television, in early 2001. I would interview people on the set. Later on, I would have bands actually play in the studio and record them live. And I would also show footage from local shows, archival footage from bands in the past, and uh, footage I took while I was on the road on tour, bands I had seen around the country. It was really a mixture of 
what to me I felt like punk rock was all about about being active about bands and doing it yourself it was trying to reach out to people who probably have no idea what DIY punk is or that anarchism can mean more than just chaos I actually was pretty lucky the part of the country I grew up in um, I I did see often like other women playing music and uh, I also was fortunate to like have a dad that like always told me like whatever I wanted to do was possible and definitely people are caught way more off guard when I'm playing drums and guitar people don't expect it from a girl and I get a lot of like oh you're you're really good for a woman or you're like one of the better female players I've seen and I'm just like I just want to be a good drummer I don't want to be a good girl drummer like I strive to be better at my instrument when I'm playing drums because I want to combat that I've had good experiences where like we've shown up to a show and there's like you know badass women that book the show and like we're running distros and other women playing the show and hosting us and stuff and seem to be really involved and then I've you know played shows where somebody was yelling why are you in the band you must be one of their girlfriends and um, played a show uh, our uh, roadie Roxanne she was trying to address some women's issues and like the men in the room wouldn't let her speak and just told her to shut up that we are good to our women here and they didn't need to hear it and, uh, and that was pretty scary. I don't ever want to go back there. I was actually listening to uh, a hip hop CD called BKC and they had a, a song and the Kunenada came out in the song and um, I was thinking about that word and how what it meant and uh, it translates to English as condemned or doomed um, and just thinking about how a lot of our experiences just getting kind of trapped in this box like oh you're the straight edge girl or you're you know like mm -hmm. the you're the drunk punk. party yeah. punk or you know you're the gay punk you know and just like or just your girls you know or you know whatever you're supposed to be this you're supposed to be that and just how you're always kind of condemned to like how people perceive you i'd see we see a lot of things in magazines like interviews in magazines where people are like it doesn't matter that we're women we just happen to be all women playing together. I'm like, fuck that. We made a conscious decision to play with other women because we were in a band with dudes. And not that it was a bad experience, it's just different. We were like, I want to try something new. But it's not like we're forcing something, you know? We got together and it worked out. We just got lucky. Yeah, but, there's always that moment, like, how how is everybody going to react? I think, I think I still get that before every show. I mean, unless it's local, like, where we know the audience, I still get that kind of feeling like, how are people gonna react? For the most part, people are really cool about it. Some women are really forward, and they just approach you, and they're like, hey, what's up? You know, it's cool to see other women playing, and I'm in this band, and that's awesome. When mm -hmm. women just approach you, and they just tell you about their projects, and what they're doing, and they give you like CDs, and you train, and mm -hmm. that's great, especially here. And in Mexico, too, man, it's blowing up. Yeah. You know, there's so many women in involved. In yeah. Punk was this male, white male scene, you know? And they, you know, they were sexist, they were homophobic. I mean, not everybody, but I'm, it was predominant in that scene. And the fact that it's shifting, a lot of people are resistant. They're like, well, you know, women can play, but why do you guys have to be such a, why does it have to be such a big deal? I think people do feel more empowered, you know, when they're surrounded by stronger women. Community. To, mm -hmm. And community just to, like, take mm -hmm. a stand. I guess I started making art like for punk flyers and scenes and things like that in like 1995 or 94. I don't know, around like 2001, 2002. I started taking like my writing and my art more seriously, trying to make zines that can be accessible to people like outside of where I'm coming from. I got feedback from a lot of girls who were experiencing the same things in regards to culture and gender and sexuality and things like that like lots of girls coming from like hip-hop scenes and things like that and then just kind of 
realizing that everything I do doesn't have to be like only focused on the like subculture that I'm coming from. Like it's nice to get a response from what I do that isn't demographically or subculturally specific. Like it's nice to get a letter from a fucking high school girl in Ohio who's never been to a punk show, just saw my book at the bookstore and read it and was like, wow, like I'm not punk, but I felt all these things in, but in like another lifestyle. It makes like what I do more like rewarding. I don't want to get out of the zine culture or like the, the punk subculture, DIY subculture. I just want to like branch out and I don't think that that is selling out in any way. If anyone knows how it feels to struggle financially, they would know how it feels to be like signed to a bigger major label or like a bigger label with my band or yeah, put out books instead of zines. I think it's really privileged to sell yourself short when you're fucking talented. Some friends of mine from Portland needed a show and I just decided to try to do it and loved it. Especially the few times I've gone through booking agents and haven't actually talked to the bands directly. When they show up and I introduce myself, they'll like look over my shoulder like, okay, well, nice to meet you, groupie, but where's the promoter? I was like, yeah, that's me. And uh, that's only happened a handful of times, but it's really upsetting every time. I wouldn't say it's a consistent problem, but it has been an issue. When we started playing in bands, we were about 18. Neither one of us could play an instrument. We were like, fuck this shit. There's like way too many dudes in hardcore and punk. And we were like, we need to like represent because we're like a part of it just as much as they are. I think the fact that we are like half our bands women, we're identical twins. We obviously draw some kind of attention. And um, I think that we've gotten a lot of positive reaction from people and a lot of like positive attention. And then there's of course, there's gonna be the negative feedback from people like on stage, oh, we wanna fuck you, or uh, writing really like nasty, demeaning emails to us, in particular me and Nicole. We get lots of negative feedback and lots of positive feedback, but I think overall, it's been mostly positive. I think so, you said? yeah. I mean, just going to shows in general, I thought was a support, you know, paying money for a band. I figured that was support too. I think it also, the big thing is the people that you hang out with. So, I mean, I don't think it really matters what genre of music they listen to or they're part of. I just think it depends on the person, maybe how they were brought up and how maybe if there's, they saw their father treat the mom badly, they thought it was okay to you know, treat females badly. So I think it really depends on the person, their environment, their, how they were brought up and everything like that. Yeah, I never even thought I was going to be going on tour every time, like each time that I went, they just asked me if I wanted to come and I'm like, they're my friends, awesome. It's like helping them bring in groceries, you know, front some money for t-shirts and whatever, printing and gas and selling books. I started selling books because everyone has a little record distro in Appleton, but nobody has, you know, the book distro. There's not an awesome bookstore here, like nothing is accessible here. And um, since we do live in the Midwest, everything's so far away. Everybody's really supportive of everything here. Even if they talk shit, you know, but, like they'll still support it. I always wanted to be in a band in high school. I always wanted to do it. Like I'd watch bands all the time and just be like, ah, oh, God damn it, like I want to do that but just was like, I can't do anything, I can't, you know, I'm just really scared. One of my friends, um, Bobby, he's a bass player, you know, he was like, dude, it's punk, like, you can do it, it's fucking punk, who cares, like, it's just punk music, which really helped me to be like, yeah, what am I talking about? Like, I'm not trying to be a professional musician or anything. we just come back from tours, so we met all these really awesome bands and really awesome people that were like, and we kept being like, come to Columbia, we'll set you up for the show, you know, we owe you one, like, come on, here's our addresses and all that shit. So then we get back to Columbia and we're like, oh, we don't have anywhere to set people up with. We don't have anywhere to practice. <laughs> like, shit, what are we doing? <laughs> Me and Bobby and a couple of the people wrote up a letter. We got together a whole bunch of people through that letter and we started having meetings. And so we found this place and this was like the end of August. We met like all of September trying to like just get it together. 
and we signed the lease October 1st and like raised the money in two, we raised like $1,200 in two days to get the lease and the deposit just from like all these people in Colombia that we were just like, we're trying to open up this place and people were just like, here's 20 bucks, that's awesome. Like, yeah, it was really awesome. It was so cool. And then it was great because when we got all the money raised, we, uh, we had all this cash. It, this is really stupid, actually, really dangerous. But we walked around the street, we got $1,200 like in Wayne's World. It was so awesome. I really felt that it was important to own the space just because I hate dealing with landlords. And some people like to laugh and joke and call me a landlord. But, you know, landlords make money and I don't make any money ever. Yeah, it's, it's really nice to own it because I don't have to worry about anyone overhead. You know, looking down, seeing what I'm doing, and if the cops come, you know, I just say, this is my house, I'm having a party with some friends, and I think that's definitely a good way to go. When we first moved in, it, it was, people did not respect us at all. We had to gain people's respect, definitely. We had people that would set off fireworks in the living room, the first party that we had. It was just a party, it wasn't even a show, you know? So it was mostly friends, and they just decided they could do whatever they wanted. And everyone thinks that the space has really come, you know, along the way. But I just see like so many more things, you know, that I want to do that cost money, and I try to save up and do just do a little bit at a time. But I think definitely when people come in and they see like the walls painted rather than just graffiti and just you know how people write stupid shit on the wall all the time. Once they see it's all painted and it looks nicer, and they respect it more too, and they realize it's not just some shit. Like, <laughs> for women now, well, for me, I feel pretty much equal. But I feel that's more because I'm established here and people know who I am. Whereas younger women in the scene, maybe they're not treated with the respect that they should be. To have an all-girl band in Boston was like, it was strange. And people, it was, we were really, strange. and we were really, it's really hyped strange. though at that point. Remember I think how, we totally yeah. still are. Yeah. For the same reasons. <laughs> like, no one's get, gotten over it at all. <laughs> yeah. One time, it wasn't with Red Thread, but I was playing guitar in Terminal Youth. I was loading equipment in and I was carrying like three guitars. And this kid's like, why is that girl carrying all their equipment? And I was just like, really? <laughs> and I just like, it made me so mad. I just screamed out because I couldn't see him. He was like in a crowd of people. I was like, because I'm in the fucking band. <laughs> I just kind of kept walking along and he sort of pretended he didn't hear me and I heard him like be like, carry your shit, bitch. And I was just like, are you kidding me? And then I like stormed out of the, the room to get more equipment, just like kind of pushed by somebody and didn't say anything. And they were like, excuse me, bitch. And I was like, are you serious? Like. This all just happened within like one minute in my own city and I'm playing a show here. Part of me is like, why am I a part of this scene, you know? And then like the other part of me is like, well, I guess that's what drives me to like play music and do this, prove myself constantly. It seems like there's a big difference though, having a band with girls in it and then having an all girl band. It's not like a token member, you know? Yeah. yeah. There's an all-girl band that's like into being an all-girl band and sings about issues that have to it's do with being like, a woman or like whatever. Makes people uncomfortable, it maybe? Does. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even like that all-girl punk house like was definitely like a huge drama issue with so many people just because they were like, why would you want to do that? It's like, no, I don't know. Why not? Like. <laughs> Punk was honestly the last thing I thought I would play. I don't know why. I just fell in love with the atmosphere. The, for the first time, I felt like I could take some type of aggression out through music or the pit. And then I know at one point I wanted to play, start playing with other females though. When I first started getting into the local scene in high school, there was not a lot of female presence whatsoever, not even in the pit. But now that I'm older, it's good that there's a lot more female bands coming out and especially in the pit too, they're actually usually in the front when before they were always standing in the back. It's not just females singing in bands anymore, like you see a lot more females playing instruments, a lot more drummers, a lot more guitar players, and I think that's really awesome. It's not just about you being able to scream into a mic, it's also about having a really awesome skill. I see as far as like change, you know, as women being more in the scene and then just having a presence, I see it slowly but surely. So then, you know, maybe if you ask the next band 10 years from now, then they'll be like, oh yeah. Now maybe you'll just you'll see like that. What do you mean there was no girl band? What? Yeah. <laughs> so.
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully like that. I, I die happy knowing that. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely got into Riot Girl when I was like 13 or 12. Like I just like met this cool girl somewhere and her like best friend made me this like sweet Riot Girl mixtape and he was like super sassy and thought he was awesome. He had this sweet Monte Carlo that he would drive me and my like 12 year old best friend around and like not a creep or anything. <laughs> he was like 16 and was like a Riot Girl, like queer, awesome, like crazy dude who like totally blew my mind. Definitely had a part to do with me like getting interested in being active in playing music. But I was already like going to shows all the time and hanging out. I just wasn't really aware that it was like something I could be also doing. When I was maybe in seventh grade or so, a lot of the men I was, or boys I guess at the time I was hanging out with were really into skate punk and stuff. So I think when, once me and my friends kind of discovered Riot Girl, it was like, wow, like there's ladies in music and they're tough. And I just wanted to see women making music. Bikini Kill, it's, it sounds cliche, but I don't give a fuck. You changed my life, they're awesome. I mean. I think it's kind of like amped us up and that's kind yeah. of like what got us into playing music because I didn't think I was a musician and like I couldn't play an instrument up until but we forced ourselves, you know, <laughs> at a late age and we forced, our, we forced yeah. ourselves, we were like we have to represent, like this is bullshit and like alright I'll sing at first and I was like alright I'll play bass, I'll keep working at it and Nicole's like I'll play guitar, play guitar. I'll turn my amp really low so no one can hear no how No one can hear me, we'll be fine. <laughs> In Bikini Kill, I was really young, you know what I mean? Like, I was in my 20s and I was still really, like, trying to figure things out. And um, in a way, I was, like, so vulnerable on stage. Like, when I look back on that time period, that's what I see more than anything. And I went away to school at University of Oregon, and I met Molly Newman, who was from D.C. and grew up in D.C., but she had decided to go to school at University of Oregon, and she was in the dorm next door to me. So, you know, she's on the other side of the wall. We just became quickly best friends. And we started Girl Germs before we started a band, before we started Brownmobile. Um, I think it was when we first started really getting into like this like feminism and punk rock and mixing the two and everything and really having a lot of talks with people like Toby and Kathleen and whatever. We just had to put our energies into creating something. I think we were kind of just trying to be funny too. But we really meant it as a fanzine. It was really fun, just like, you know, just feeling you had a voice and that you had something to say and that people might read it. There is this kind of strange Olympia DC connection that, I mean, there's a lot of elements to that. Um, like my connection to it was really through Molly and she grew up here. And um, I remember there was this time where if you got like a credit card, you could get all these cheap uh, plane tickets and you can go anywhere in the US. And so I'm like, I started going to DC for really cheap on like spring break and winter break and I just go with Molly and hang out. And in DC when we started actually having regular meetings like people were just straight up angry that women would meet alone for one hour. It was like they went crazy because they were being disincluded in something. And if, if they wouldn't have been disincluded I feel like they wouldn't have cared at all. And it definitely wasn't all guys, there were total allies. There's always been allies. More than that, there's always been guys who were like really pissed that they were not included. Who I felt like if they were included, wouldn't show up. I think some people were, did feel really threatened and usually men, but some women too, I think in a way. Um, I think sometimes it was just this real like kind of lack of understanding of privilege and oppression that I think everyone can go through, you know, and or not knowing where to where it applies, you know, or whatever. And that sometimes people would be like, well, that's not equal. Well, that's not fair. Like we had a Riot Girl show where girls got in for two dollars and guys got in for three dollars and there was an outrage about it from the guys. But then we also gave guys an option. Well, if you come and drag, you can get in for two. And if you don't want to support us, then don't. 
But so sometimes there'd be weird backlash that you're just with from your friends who are guys and you're just like, shut up, you know, stop complaining, you know. The momentum was so insane, like it just went. Like it was out of control, not out of control, but in a way it was because it was like, like rapid fire, you know? This shit's hard and you're young and you're trying to figure it out and there's all these people paying attention to you like you're the next big thing. So you have to save feminism from its stodgy, glorious Steinem times. It's up to you. So not like, I, you know, we didn't necessarily done anything different or better. Well, different, definitely better, who knows. You just didn't really know who to trust and what people wanted from you. Like, everyone seemed to want a piece of it somehow. And if it was just to diss it, to build themselves up, maybe, or was it to exploit it somehow, or was it to genuinely be a part of something, whatever, you know. But there was so much kind of going on all at once that it was hard to sort through it. And I think a lot of us were completely unprepared to deal with the onslaught of attention in whatever way, you know. And I think whenever you get a lot of, like, strong, opinionated people who have been marginalized in one way or the other, and you get them all in a room, and maybe they have not been heard their whole lives, or listened to, or, you know, they've been silenced their whole lives, and so then it's like, sometimes you just feel like this is your one chance, you know, and marginalized people have been made to feel like there's not enough room for all of us, you know, and we are very easily and quickly pitted against each other. Sometimes it just started feeling like playground fights, and it just ate itself. I feel like it really ate itself for all, all these reasons, and probably more of it I'm not even mentioning. So. I might have just been like older, and I like totally was into what they were doing, but I wasn't really involved with it. For me, I was in this sort of phase in my life where I was like, man, yeah, I can't deal with that kind of stuff. Like, I can't keep on talking about this topic over and over. Like, I always felt like what I was doing, I was trying to represent it in a subtle way. By doing what I wanted to do and just doing it. I've never really listened to Riot Girl, and <laughs> Anarcho Punk affected me probably just as much as Riot Girl affected these younger female punks. I mean, I'm a feminist, and Phil was a feminist, but I don't know, for some reason, the political punk scene and the riot girl scene were kind of two different things. I mean, when I saw Bikini Kill at Gilman, they were awesome. I was like, they're so great, that's just so cool. Um, but there wasn't any sense of camaraderie with them. Um, but I saw Spitboy play all the time. And they became friends of mine, and they were awesome, and they had the same messages. But they, to me, I feel like I could relate to them more. Um, well, A, because I knew them, but also they were punks. There was a lot of other women who were maybe more peripherally involved, or they weren't even in Riot Girl, yet they were all getting called Riot Girls at the time. I can see how some women were just sort of like, huh, what, you know, why can't I just be myself? I mean, if something's mostly created by, say, white, middle class, um, maybe often straight girls, then it's probably going to end up reflecting the values or the upbringings or whatever of those people who created it. Like they always wanted to put us in with Riot Girls, we really didn't fit with Riot Girls, you know. And we're like, well, we're, you know, we're, it's no put down on them or us. It's just not really our thing. Nobody looked hard enough to me, and I was like, people are trying to stop being scary. That's dangerous. I think that's what it was. I, I felt that we were endangering ourselves as women by looking soft. I never went to meetings. I never, you know, I played a couple shows that might have been called Riot Girl, but I was definitely not involved. I was too busy, like, drinking and fucking and being a narcissist. I gravitated towards just heavy, heavy music and hardcore. I wanted to play hardcore and, you know, drink beers and hang out with the guys. So, I, yeah, I missed, I missed that whole Riot Girl thing. It's cool that they can all get together and be girls together, but I think it was just as important for girls to infiltrate a male dominant scene, like the metal scene or the punk scene, and say, all right, you guys rock, but so can we. That kind of went over my head, the Riot Girl scene, because I was I'm from such a rural area, and I did love L7 and stuff like that, but I didn't really get, like, I had some bikini kill, and 
that's pretty much it. Like I was not exposed to that. I was actually more exposed to punk and hardcore. I was not involved in Riot Girl uh, in Boston or Tennessee. We sort of found our own way. I think the effects of uh, Riot Girl definitely trickled out throughout uh, the national scene. Women in punk will get together uh, however they can. It's important for other, especially younger women, to see that there are different types of women in the scene, or just different types of women, period. But even within punk, because you don't have to buy $90 bondage pants and a mohawk, you know? There's different stereotypes too, and that's the danger of that whole thing, and that's why I think feminism, do feminism does work. We're redefining it every day. I believe the first time I heard the word feminism was always in the context of those feminazis, those women who are so uppity and you know, all these horrible jokes. And where I lived, the backlash against feminism was definitely in full swing. Being a feminist was someone who believed in equal rights for women, who believed that patriarchy is not the natural state for humans and that we can build a better world built more on equality between the sexes. Feminism isn't something that you just read from a book. It's like anything. You know, you need a background, you need under, you know, a foundation, I understand that. But if you don't live what you think, then it doesn't, it has served no function whatsoever. You can say you're a feminist, but that means so many things. Mm -hmm. So to think that you can approach a person the same way every time, I think is is silly. I think it's important to learn about the history of it, but it's very important to remember that we need to apply it to now and that we need to do things now. We need to not only fight for women in punk, but we need to fight for the women that are out there. Well, I've always felt like all of the isms are connected. Do you know what I mean? It's not like, I feel like a feminism without a race analysis isn't really a feminism I want to be a part of, and a feminism without a class analysis isn't really a feminism I want to be a part of. Anarchist feminist politics really opened me up to being more radical on like everything because it's such a great philosophy and a way of looking at things where you're way more fair and compassionate and way less brainwashed. You can see things more clearly. It influences me um, to do anything that I fucking want. It makes you stronger and I've learned so much about myself and like learned to be so much more understanding and respectful of like people within my gender. Because before I did, I fucking didn't like girls. I didn't get along with them, da 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 da, you know? Because like you didn't fit that mold. I see like my other women that like I know who I'm friends with who like never got into it and I'm just like I was deeply involved in DIY punk and also feminism, but the two worlds were very separate for quite some time. That I wanted these two worlds to come together, I believe it should be integrated as much as possible. And a lot of people come into the punk scene thinking it's an ideal world where they're not going to come across sexism, homophobia, racism, all the isms and phobias. And, but that's not true. It exists there as well and needs to be addressed there as well. This is still like where I live. This is my community. I, like punk is my family and like where I feel most comfortable no matter what anyway. And like I do feel like there are definite issues across the board everywhere. But I also feel like more supported in this community than I do anywhere else. There are many people in the punk scene in Boston and outside of Boston that are like amazing, supportive. We're trying to defy the mainstream culture. And if we don't have more women involved here, then we're kind of not defying that mainstream culture. We're kind of reflecting it.
I've talked to a lot of women that have left punk because they thought it was so sexist. We have to change the things that could be leading to a turnover rate for women. Or just becoming more aware is going to keep, keep women involved. I think it's also important to be critical of others, not be afraid to call people out. You know, reactions, it's not a comfortable thing, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. <laughs> I've been inspired by lots of women in the past and I really hope to be that to somebody younger than me or not younger than me. And I think that's the way that we can make this community grow better and by men being more respectful and uh, opening their arms to women coming into, you know, music. Feminism was there before and it's there after and just because like Riot Girl hit a peak in the media, it doesn't mean that it went away. There's all these waves of feminism, first wave, second wave, third wave, you know, and that's true in the punk scene as well. There's, there's all these women now who have come before us who we can look to and ask questions of. A way has been forged and it's just a matter of kind of branching off from that and forging the future paths for the next generation of women who are coming up. We've built this community of women that are feminists and we do trust each other. And I think punk is what brought us all together. That's how I met everybody here, you know. It was really, really good to see some, some ladies playing tonight, and um, we don't get to see that that much, and it made me feel really fucking good. So um, everything I do tonight is dedicated to the ladies in this room, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna play. Thank you. I'll go to punk shows and uh, look around and wonder where are all the, the women on stage? It happens all too frequently and I think a lot of it is just due to inattention and a lack of consciousness about the subject. Without thinking people will just book a show with all men on stage and then I get there and I feel left out. When you're at a show and you're not represented on stage, I feel um, excluded. I think that every genre has like a huge difference because some are more suited just to be inclusive. I've noticed that more like fashion oriented punks don't seem to have females that are really more involved beyond the fashion and the guys are the ones playing in the band and there might be one girl but for the most part it's like they'll have like a mannequin girlfriend. Most music is dominated by men, so I think that, of course, it's going to be like that in the punk scene. Although there's way more, you know, there's far more girls doing stuff. Like, I couldn't expect to go to a concert and see five bands and have at least one girl in every band, which you can often do. Once we start actually thinking about uh, things like social responsibility and the, the social rewards and visibility that people in bands get, uh, it's kind of a crushing responsibility to think about. I mean, you can't obviously know everything about everybody who you're helping promote, basically, as a person and in a band. So it puts you in a position of having to just make hard and unpopular decisions and figure out who you want to make visible and who you don't, and who you're going to allow to take up space in the community and who you're not going to. And I kind of like the idea that my efforts would only be accessible to the people that I choose for them to be, and that I'm not ever um, ingratiated to anyone, even you know, financially or favors-wise. I guess that's one thing that is exciting to me still about booking DIY shows, is I hope that people, when they do it, they do it from a genuine love of wanting something to be presented. You know, some people might wonder, well, why are you making a lot of inquiries into if you've heard an allegation of assault by someone in a band, why are you digging to find out more? I mean, you're just putting on the show. It's the same way of being like a cog in a, in a system. If I, if I am not making those kinds of inquiries and putting my energy into something, I don't feel like those spaces are sort of like fertile and nurturing incubators for young women to develop and to feel like, wow, my, these, like somebody gives a shit about what my experience is. And I always think like, I gotta want to keep energy around, like setting up shows. What if this is someone's first show? This could be someone's formative experience. And 
what do they see when they come here. I don't want to be part of their world, I want to be part of our world, which we create. And our world is, you know, it's anarchy, but it's uh, like worked out anarchy that, you know, we respect each other and we get a voice to each other and we get to hear other people's ways of life. It was our message to go to punk shows everywhere we could. Any, like, you know, any big punk thing that would be happening around the country, we'd try to get in. You know, it'd be some big thing happening for a weekend in Indianapolis or something in D.C. And we'd call up and say, hey, you got to have us. You know, we need to represent. And usually they would, you know, and it'd be us and all these, you know, hardcore punk rock bands. I think we made a difference and I hope we still are. I do worry that people have a place to talk and really feel like there's a place to have a movement and make a change. I think about this every day, you know, what are women's roles in punk? Whenever I go to shows or like after shows, um, there always seems to be a group of men in the middle. They're all talking about the music, and then I see the group of women. If you don't include women, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna leave, you know? They're gonna find another scene or just go back into mainstream society. We need to keep women involved. And I think Clip Fest or La Revolta, or um, just having conferences on feminism, or just becoming more aware is gonna keep, keep women involved. You can't really wait for things to happen. You have to kind of make them happen. If you, if you want to have a record, then you make a record. If you want to play a show, then you book a show. You make it happen. You have to make your place in the punk scene. Like, man, woman, queer, like, whatever. There's, I mean, it's open, it's a family, but you still have to come in and, and, and make your place, whether it's in the pit or playing or whatever. Like, Nobody's gonna just hand it to you, and I think a lot of people are kind of scared off. You know, oh yeah. By that, and don't feel, feel about don't it. Want, yeah. Don't want to make their place. Like they, it's not that important to them. But for me, honestly, like just everything that punk represents, especially the music. Like I, you know, I found it, and that was my home. I think it's just really important to acknowledge people and what they do, and you know, acknowledge their existence and, and hope for their participation. Invite their participation. Maybe eye contact and, and a little, you know, head nod or hello or a little smile is, is just enough to like be like, hey, I'm including you in this. I don't really feel like I want to see the same voices over and over. And to me, music is a voice. There are a lot of perspectives and interpretations that when you engage diverse people, and when diverse people are creating those kinds of perspectives, it's just much more rich, it's much more healthy. People don't have to consider something until it's part of their world, or until you, you know, force it into their world by conversation or by sharing your own typical experiences. And uh, people don't understand why on earth you wouldn't feel comfortable at a poorly lit house show, or like why you know you might not be as stoked as shit about having shows at your house, or having a bunch of you know strangers or like drunk people at your house. A lot of the workshops that we've done have been around community response to sexual assault, and I think I like the idea that communities would look at and have long, ongoing conversations about the issues and concerns that are repeatedly coming up in those communities. The idea that a community has some intimate knowledge about how its problems could be addressed. And to me, workshops can be a place where those get generated and talked about. It's a good way to open up a space for dialogue, and we try to do it as safely as possible. If these conversations are not happening solely in times of crisis, immediate crisis, I think that's really good because then if you're having ongoing discussions, people have already talked with other people in their community about it, um, about what they would do if, and so people are able to draw on some tools that weren't solely 
hypothetical. Yeah, yeah. They, they have the language and frame of reference. Yeah, absolutely. There was this thing that happened, and I, I got raped, and I wrote a song about it, and people wrote me, like guys and girls wrote me so many letters, like, we can't talk to anybody else about this kind of stuff, but we, you made us feel like we can talk to you. And uh, so I've actually made a few pen pals out of discard, like those lyrics, you know, and then people writing me and like, wow, that's cool, thank you for standing up and, and saying something, now we have the strength to do this as well and we're going to go to counseling and whatnot. And, uh, so that kind of made me feel really good. The more you scream it out and the more the louder you get about it, the more it helps out yourself and other people as well. I think it's really heartening to see how many people have wanted a place to talk about this. And also the other thing that we've noticed is I started to want to ask the question, how many of you ever talked about consent in your sex ed yeah, classes in, that in, in school? And it's it's really scary to me. You know? There was one hand at our last workshop. Yeah, and it's like I think he was homeschooled. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of the biggest myths about sexual assault, you know, in the world, you know, let alone in the punk scene, is that assaulters are just a predator in the park or like in the bushes and wall. Assault definitely happens under every circumstance imaginable. I think that it's somewhere in the like low to mid 70% about how many survivors know their assaulter. The two people in my life that I experienced the most violence from were white men associated with the punk community or the independent music community who had pretty much the same class and educational background. I experienced like one too many times with myself and friends alike. Men in the scene being fucked up being rapists, being very like verbally abusive and, and having like this very large presence, like, oh, I'm in this band, like, what's up? Women who have called out these people were not really um, taken seriously. I did experience men like not being held accountable. If we're trying to create this intensely equal community, I think that everyone's voice should be heard. And like that wasn't really the case in a lot of situations I was in. It's like, okay, it's punk, but it's not like a fucking safe space. I don't think that's jaded of me. I just think people should be realistic that shit isn't perfect. Philly's Pissed um, started when a series of rapes occurred at Pointless Fest. And Philly's Pissed just formed in a way like we have any survivors back. Like we have your back if you're fucked with, like we'll do whatever you want in order to cater to your needs and like help you out if you don't want to get the law involved, if you don't want to get like your parents involved, if you don't want to talk to the person who hurt you, like we'll talk to them for you. Different collective members from all over the city in Minneapolis got together when a couple girls were raped in Philadelphia at the Pointless Fest some years back. But there were also people that were like, well, have fun at your witch hunt. After that Pointless Fest where I think several women had been assaulted, and then there was that, you know, that group of women that got together and they visited that girl and they were like, what do you want us to do? And she's like, fuck them up, you know? And a lot of people had mixed reactions to that. Well, that's not right, and this and that. I'm like, but you know what? Since when does the law guarantee justice anymore? Somebody that doesn't treat you like a human being, are you supposed to talk to them? You know, like, you're just not on an even level. I mean, I don't believe that violence answers all of everything, you know, obviously. Sometimes people say that when you're in that situation, when someone's assaulting you, you kind of get it over with, you know? There's don't fight, don't do this. Like, you have to gauge your situation. And that's another way of surviving. I've really, really worked hard on training myself to be able to react in that kind of situation. So for me, if you approach me that way, I am gonna fucking stab you. Like, that's just what's gonna happen. I mean, it's not trying to be like, I'm so tough and I can kick everyone's ass, because I know I can't. But am I supposed to wait for someone else to defend me and my body, you know? Like, if a situation like that comes out, I'm confident that I'll be able to react in a way that's gonna help me survive.
one page has like this miracle weight loss thing. This the next page has like pictures of uh, famous stars that have gained weight and how they should look better. The next page has an article about like a woman or a man who's in an eating disorder clinic and how sickly they look. I mean, I even sometimes find myself, if I'm reading those magazines a lot or anything like that, I find myself falling into feeling like I have to feel a certain way or just being more constantly thinking about weight or um, just body image issues. You can't be a punk solely living in a punk world. We actually have to step outside of that and that's, I think that's when it hits us. It really doesn't hit me when I'm at shows that I'm overweight. I'm me, that's who I am. It, it, it hits me when I'm on the bus or when I'm walking down the street. And I mean, it gets to me at times. People talk about this all the time, how the media portrays women and how we're all obsessive about it. It's true. I mean, we all get caught up in that stuff, all of us. No matter how far above you think you are, at some point you're gonna think, Am I too fat? Am I too skinny? I don't have boobs. I have too much, you know, there's too much hair. There's not enough hair. Like, we take ourselves apart. When it's ingrained in you from the very beginning, it's just gonna happen. And I think it's just something that is really hard for people to overcome. I know tons of people who have eating disorders. I know tons of people who feel like they're not happy with themselves. And it's so hard because you don't know how to stop those feelings. You don't know how to address it because you can't tell people not to be involved with the media because it's everywhere. It's not just women that are affected by this whole thing. And it's, it's, there's an alarming rate of men with, with eating disorders. It gets to me that there are people out there in our scene that feel so uncomfortable in themselves that they, they hate themselves. And I think that's what bothers me because I just wish that people could accept themselves and know that there are times when you're gonna be down on yourself. You get depressed, that's that's human. Talking about it and bringing it up in front of people and being like, yeah, I'm fucking punk and I'm fat and I like it, but it doesn't mean that I don't like have to deal with the way that this like fucking society makes you feel. It doesn't mean that I don't have body issues. Like I definitely do and like so do many of my friends who are of all different sizes. <laughs> You shouldn't feel bad about it. It's just something that you should talk about or talk to somebody else about it. Or blow it off, you know? Whatever way you have to deal with it, just deal with it. It's personal, but at the same time, you know, you have people around you that can help you with that. Definitely, like, being a punk girl who is, like, strong and, like, has, like, opinions and doesn't let people, like, fuck with her. Don't, doesn't mean I don't get my period and feel ugly or something. <laughs> like... <laughs> to be perfectly honest, um, I do get tired of guys commenting on how they feel about my appearance. Because I dress really trashy and slutty. I'm gonna have to realistically expect a certain reaction from that, just because of human nature. And like, if you're attracted to something, then you're gonna say something. But I get a little tired of it with bands. I know that there's plenty of, of dudes that just like to watch me and not, and could really give a fuck. I could be saying like all kinds of bad things about them and they wouldn't care because I'm wearing like no clothes. And you know, and they're like, oh wow. But I definitely get sick of, of guys kind of, ooh, ooh, you look hot, you know. I guess old. <laughs> I could, well, what, do you, don't you want to talk about music or something? Like, anything? Um, this next song was written because um, there's all different kinds of ways that people resist. And you might look at a girl and go, oh, she's not a feminist because she looks like a mall girl. Like, she wears limited clothes, so she doesn't exist, or something like that. And that's bullshit, because we're all in different places right now. Don't let other people tell you what, what you need to wear, or how you need to look. There were a couple of preppy girls when I was growing up, and to this day, that come to shows, and um, they get shunned. Nobody wants to talk to them. And a lot of times, those people are the most excited to be there because it's something new. You don't have to change yourself to look like everybody else. We still are catty people and it's really kind of sad. And we still, you know, are exclusive and we have to, you have to fit in this certain mold. It's like, oh, well you don't fit in. You're not wearing a bullet belt so you can't come in. Punks fucking look the part. They may not wear makeup, but they spend hours sewing fucking patches on their pants. Just like a drag queen is gonna spend hours picking out the right wig, the right makeup, 
fucking stealing MAC makeup to have the best lip. It's like the same fucking shit, except a different world. If you have a fucked up life, you kind of want to go out and be fabulous every now and then. And like, that's totally fine. And it's still punk because you're punk. <laughs> When I was 19, I had an abortion. And after that, there's nobody to talk to, nobody to help me with that decision. I had to make it all on my own. My boyfriend at the time was a complete piece of shit. And it was so hard, you know? It was hard. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm not gonna be like, oh my God, life is hard for anyone else. But anyone going through that, you don't have a lot. Now you have counseling afterwards and stuff like that, but that's one of those things, you know? I still feel bad and I still feel guilty. And then I feel guilty for feeling guilty. You know, like I shouldn't, I'm empowered, you know? it's like. I'm allowed to feel all of those things. Well, when I, uh, I got pregnant, I didn't want to stop anything. Um, but I also didn't want to mess with the pregnancy. Um, I agonized for several days over whether or not, you know, we were going to continue with this or not. And I decided, yes, I want to. So I, I talked to my midwife about it. And I said, is it going to be a problem to play shows while I'm pregnant? And she said, no. She said, that baby is so well protected in there, you got no worries at all. So um, I was eight and a half months pregnant, and we played a show in a hockey arena for 3,000 people with Fugazi. And that was awesome. It was tremendous. And I wore a tutu and a little half shirt with my big belly sticking right out. They had a stool on stage for me to sit on if I needed to. Obviously, it's a challenge because it does stretch my time out even that much more. Um, I work full time in a photo lab. I do a zine, which is cons you know kind of like a full time job. I still want to be able to do everything, but then there's that like realistic side that says like got a lot going on. <laughs> full time job, kids, zine, you know, like life, you know. So I don't know. Dulce Doom broke up because I mean, we were in the middle of re recording our LP and my boyfriend at the time and I had gotten pregnant. So we moved to Philadelphia where we could afford to live as opposed to New York. Bought a house, got married, did the whole American dream thing and I played the housewife role for a minute. That's a choice as well. It's like, yeah, all right, I could be a f big rock star, but I mean, I made the choice to, to be a mom. I remember when when Soul Sidoon broke up, we did a bunch of we did a, a series of interviews and scenes and stuff. And the quote that stuck out the most for me was, "Someone had asked me, do you regret having to break up the band?" I said, "Well, all right. I started the band thinking I could change the world, you know, punk rock, change the world. I'm having a child. I know I can change the world now. I won't." probably be as active every day in the day to day. Um, but that's because I I want to devote a lot of my life to my kid. I'm really excited about it. I've done a lot of living and a lot of partying and I don't feel like I don't feel like I'm gonna miss that a lot. After he was born, we kinda had to shift things around a little bit. Um, but we went on our first tour with Sam when he was eight months old. He was just learning how to walk. So we'd bring a nanny with us to take care of Sam while we were actually playing. And the rest of the band was great. Um, everyone was really helpful and we had to keep our drive short. We'd have to take a break every three or four hours. But he took to the road like a duck to water. He was amazing. When he was a year, we toured Europe. He spent his first birthday in Germany and we had a nanny there as well. And then the last couple tours we were on, Sam actually wanted to get up on stage with us. So he ended up playing with us. He had a little pink plastic guitar and big heavy industrial headphones and he'd get up and he rocked it. I mean he was amazing and everyone in the band was tremendous too. Everyone really, it was like a family. You know it takes a village to raise a child. In our case it took a band to raise a child. Your priorities change. You shift. Uh, I can't be as politically active as, as I used to be, but I know that by raising my daughter to have an open mind, to be not just a girl, but to be, you know, an active woman in society, to contribute to society, it's like I know my influence on her is going to influence, you know, like a chain reaction. She talks about being a teacher, 
you know, I mean, what a great opportunity that would be for her to, to share, you know, everything that I've taught her with another generation and to just spread, spread a seed like that and having the community and the family to help raise her is great. She's met so many amazing, strong women. Um, she gets to see all different kinds of people and it's out of the stereotype. I mean, it's an opportunity for her to experience different people that she's not necessarily going to experience and it's not the kind of thing they teach you in school. some more you know like that song made me cry when we first started playing it because Miriam wrote it and wrote it about like my ongoing struggle with my parents with my family who I had to just like walk away from like I don't have contact with my blood family from my little brother because the fact that I'm gay and I'm a punk like you know mm -hmm. the two like they can't get over that and it would spend such a struggle and the song is about how the families always think it's so hard for them, you know, it's so hard for us, like, why did you do this, we did, blah, 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 how could you do this to us, what are the neighbors going to think? Meanwhile, completely dismissing, like, the struggles that we're going through, like, struggling to be like, I want to be a part of my family. A lot of times, when you come out, it's, you go through this crisis, because you just end up abusing yourself, you know, you want to numb yourself to this problem, whether it's a lot of alcoholism, drug use, or... People become anorexic, they develop the eating disorders. I mean, we talk about that in that song too. And a lot of people don't come out because they're afraid of hurting their families or afraid of doing all this, but like there's this girl in California that we met and she sent us an email. You guys have inspired me to, to come out to my parents. And she did. And she came she out to emailed us like, yeah. Yeah, like a month ago. And mm -hmm. she's like, I came out, it was the best thing I ever did. Thank you guys. You know, I was like, oh. she was like, I got, you know, I'm not yeah. an emotional person. And I was like, oh my God. When I have been in love with a woman, like it's frowned upon by my culture and by my family and by everything I knew growing up. So I'm not really out to the, like to that part of my life, which is really fucking hard for me. Like I can't be like, woo, like by pride. I'm just gonna like discuss it as it is in my life. I'm not gonna argue with someone and I'm not gonna feel like unqueer if I'm like with a man bisexuality is like a valid feeling like it's not like party by or by curious it's like I want to fuck everyone like everyone's hot trying to be a punk rocker in the early days did feel left out being a dyke and it felt very invisible there always was that like you know you got to pick your side are you a dyke or are you a punk rocker kind of thing and that was not cool you know so when we came we already knew it was an issue. We knew it had been an issue for years. At the time that I was in the Bay Area, like the big gay issue was AIDS. I don't think you can ta even talk about um, identity politics in punk rock at that period without talking about AIDS because it absolutely affected everything. Everyone was dying and everyone was sick. It's obviously political when a lot of people are dying and a lot of people are blaming them for it. And, and a lot of punk wasn't addressing that. So, so that became a rift because a lot of people were grieving and punk meant like not using everybody else's categories despite the fact that everyone's using their categories on you. Like I'm just going to ignore the fact that everyone is labeling me and I get like the laws discriminate and everything. I'm just going to say I don't, I don't participate. At the time I was like, oh, you know, I'm not going to identify as queer or punk or anything. I'm going to be nothing. I'm just going to be myself. And then as my awareness got raised about like why it was important to identify, then later I identified. Things are real different now than they were back in 1990, 91, when the band started. In the old days, you didn't even really want to talk about being something. You just kind of was, you know, you didn't make a big deal of it. At least it's been out in the open, talked about enough, and nobody's surprised someone comes up and says, well, I'm a dyke, or I'm a tranny, or I'm a this. I don't feel like it's as, as big of a deal as it used to be. We only have a few gay punks, but it seems like that's it. I mean, you can, we'll connect with other queer punks in other cities, but they're so few and far between now. A lot of people who are gay have a gay life and have a punk life. It shouldn't have to be so segregated. <laughs> People are so stuck in their little holes, like you're not supposed to stray from anything. And that's just sad, because things get boring after a while, you know? And I don't want to burn out, so 
and I don't want anybody else tripping out. So I, I like to encourage people to explore as many different things as they can and not care whether it's punk or not, just do it. Bands that are kind of like, they don't have exposure to like gay, lesbian, trans population at all, you know, because they're just like, we're dudes or whatever. Um, <laughs> Like, it's not even a negative, it's not like they're like, I hate fag, you know I mean? It's not like that, you know? They're not like that, it's just one of those things where it's unknown, so you don't know what to say, you don't know how to act, it's kind of an uncomfortable situation for them. You know? Being queer in the punk community, if, if you choose, it kind of gives you a, a place to teach people. Where when we first started, the slightest comment anybody would say, I hear faggot, and I'd be off. Freak. Like, I would freak out, start shaking, and I just was Clutch like, people. you know? And we were like, calm down, you know? like. Most of the time, like, you get a lot more across by calming down and just being like, hey, you realize when you said that, that there's a faggot standing right behind you. Yeah. Like, were you talking to me? And, yeah. like, it usually, Hardcore. you know, people instantly are like, oh, I didn't, you know, like, no, I didn't mean that. Like, it wasn't, you know, I didn't mean it like that. It's like, well, you know, it's a really aggressive word and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, have a conversation with people. Nine times out of ten, it's going to come out cool and you're going to end up shaking hands and maybe even, like, hugging, you know? Hug it out. Hug it out. I have a friend. He's like my best friend, and he's gay. And he kind of removed himself from the DIY scene because he was like the gay kid. Like he was like the token gay guy in like the punk scene. And when he would express wanting to go to like a, a gay bar or like just like a gay situation that wasn't a meeting about queerness, straight dude punks who were his pals would give him shit for it. And it was like, why? You're not gay. You don't fucking know how it feels. I'd be like, you're gay? That's so cool. You have gay <laughs> people in your band? You know? <laughs> I don't like labels, you know, even as like a feminist or, you know, dyke or I consider myself queer. And I guess if I had to have a label, it would be like more gender queer. Until a couple years ago, I never even had the experience. You know, lately people come up and they'll be like, what's your preferred pronoun? Your PGP, your preferred gender pronoun. And I'm like, over the years, I've come to realize, like, I'm 31, I don't have one. You know, you still have to treat each other like human beings. There's a mutual respect, like, hey, you do something I'm doing, and I'm doing something that you're doing. Like, we can meet together in that, in that one place, if not anywhere else. Gender obviously has become a huge issue in our society, or the times, and sexuality. You don't have to be a dyke to be tough. You don't have to be a queen to be feminine. You know, you know. You don't have to have these roles so much, but you can just try to figure out who you are, play with different things, and see where your power comes out of. If you think about it, every show in LA, because the Latino community is a Latino fest because it's all Latinos, whether you're Mexican, Salvadorian, or it doesn't matter. It's all Latino community, so every show is a Latino fest. It's like 98% white people, right? Something like that. I don't think that's diverse at all, <laughs> which is kind of like weird and ironic because like the city of Philadelphia is like such a diverse city. It, I think so it's like 50% different cultures. African American. And yeah, the punk scene is definitely not showing 50% African-American or anything like that, you know? But I think it's just kind of the case in like a lot of, a lot of like movements or alternative kind of like countercultures. Not all, but I mean, even feminism has always been predominantly white and a lot of just like activism just, just is. I guess one of the reasons maybe being, you have to be in like a position of privilege to be critical of your surroundings. I don't think it's mixed as much as it could be, especially being in a city like Philadelphia, where you have a huge mix of races living on top of each other. We all have different cultures, and sometimes we clash, and sometimes we get along, but the punk scene itself is just a stereotypical white male scene, and it is really discouraging. When I was 19, it seemed very romantic and beautiful that like my life was just surrounded by these people who were so strict about living this pure lifestyle that was very ethical and very punk rock. But I felt completely removed from my culture. Like minor things, like even like veganism made me feel rejected from my culture. You know, everybody points to Los Crudos and talks about their influence, and they had a huge influence, they did. It, it was that push that a lot of people needed, or a lot, it, it exposed a lot of issues that people have to deal with in this 
particular community or this area. Like when um, South Core Fest happened, it was huge, huge, and the place was filled, and it was a majority of Latino be people, punks, like rockers, metal people, you know, metal dudes, like everybody was hanging out. And I noticed there were people that were there that were like kind of uncomfortable, but I'm like, it's okay to feel weird. Like that's, that's no, but that's yeah. the first step that you have to take into understanding why it is you feel this way. Like, why do I feel strange walking into, into Little Village, into this venue where it's all punks, but it's mostly Latino. It's like, because culture transcends all that stuff and it's infused in everything that you do. So you have to respect other people, you know, that's it. And it either comes naturally to you or you learn. We have a responsibility to the community that we, we live in and we have a responsibility to the community that we actually do our shows in. There is no perfect community. Like there's awesome punks and there's shitty punks and there's awesome ideals that have like risen from punk and then there's like crappy fucking lies that have arisen from punk and like you just kind of have to deal with the imperfection like for the last two years i've just been supportive of my friends bands and like going to shows but not really treating it as my like community like my community is women my community is like cuban people my community is punk rock but it's like None of those communities are perfect. Like fucking homophobia is rampant in like Latin culture. Nothing's perfect and like punk is still a part of me. Solely basing on my experience, advice that I would have loved to have gotten, it's just like there's nothing wrong with having a lifestyle that isn't limiting. My advice younger girls would be to just get involved in making your community a better place. It doesn't necessarily have to be punk. Just check other things out. There's so many things to be interested in. And, and I don't think that punk music and literature is the only thing out there that's interesting. Don't feel pressured. Don't feel pressured to be like everyone else. You can make something new. Um, and you should make something new. Bring it from the heart and, and make it completely new and relevant and it might not be punk. Find what you enjoy and do it, do it well. Stick to what's important to you, work really hard um, to make it happen, and don't be embarrassed if you fuck up. You are your own person and don't depend on anyone. Work on building your own self-confidence and, and empowering yourself. I think that the punkest thing that exists is like having your heart in your like identity, what you do, especially when it's frowned upon by like mainstream culture. You kind of really have to be yourself to really be punk. And I know it's hard, but you just kind of have to. And remember, you belong here just as much as anyone else does. And go off, because it's awesome. <laughs> I think that's really important for young girls to see people playing in bands and people doing zine distros and setting up shows and making documentaries, because that really does make you feel like you can do anything and it's not just a boys club and that you are included as much as you want to include yourself. I think it's just important to, to just do it if that's what you want to do and for us people that are getting older to really encourage younger women to, to do that and for guys to encourage their female friends to just do it. You just got to do it, you know, and, and you, can't, you can't wait for something to happen. You have to make it happen for yourself. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Go for it. If you can write, write a zine. Make, you know, do a zine. If you can, if you do want to play, you know, buy a shitty guitar from the pawn store. Whatever, you know, just do something. And you just gotta do it. Like you're definitely gonna meet opposition, but it just makes it that much more satisfying whenever you do it by yourself. I mean, don't let anybody get in your way. It doesn't mean you can't do it. And that nobody knows what they're doing when they first start out. And it's like, it might seem really overwhelming, but you just do it and figure it out and it happens and it's awesome. Just stand your own ground and be who you are and like, just keep going. I mean, there's always gonna be somebody down there who's gonna like try to knock you down off like your own pedestal or whatever, but you can't let anybody do that. Definitely follow your heart and follow what you believe in. And it doesn't matter what the guy next to you says or what um, the magazine says or what the television says. But what your parents say, you can do it. Anyone can do it. You just have to believe in yourself. Just believe in yourself. Don't take any shit. 
um, anybody tries to, you know, bring you down or say something negative about your, your participation, fuck them. I mean, self-esteem and confidence, that's all you need. And um, use your voice. It's important to speak up and use your voice. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. It can be hard at the beginning, but it gets easier. I hope they learn to tell the rest of the world to F off and, you know, don't fall into the commercial bullshit. Make money, that's what matters. Go have children. Please don't have any children. Just stop having children altogether. Don't have children. Don't make money. Try to live as poorly as you freaking can and see what's, you know, down by the ocean. Take, take a look at the ocean. Take a look at your brother and sister and your, you know, your pal and see what they need and try to take care of each other. It's hard growing up and having a vision of your own and trying to make it happen. Like if you have a strong vision or strong ideas about things to make it happen, but you just have to keep on holding on to it because it's really there. It's really cool to see it come to, you know, fruition or wherever it's gonna go. Because it does lead you in really cool places and that's what I would say. Never let go of it.